Hey, I'm Nick Bio, welcome to Pocket for Wednesday, the 13th of July. Today on the show, Pokemon news again. A quick dip in a pool, and Goose finally had another opinion about something. All right, it's time for the daily Pokemon Go news, because it seems like the only thing anyone is talking about. And first up, you Pokemaniacs have spent a bunch of money on those little augmented freaks. This is mainly just duct tape, right? Did you make this? Yeah. No bueno. Analysts at Super Data Research estimate that Pokemon Go has managed to generate 14.04 million US dollars across iOS and Android in its first week, and it's not even out across the globe yet. The same group put Mitomo's lifetime earnings at $115,000 and Niantic's first augmented effort, Ingress, at $1.1 million. But of course, not all Pokemon Go stories are so positive. Some of them are sad. Like this. We've all heard the tales of teens finding corpses, people being held up at lure points, dudes falling into ponds, more on that later, and homes being turned into Pokemon gym battlegrounds. But the latest is a request for a bit of respect. The United States Holocaust Museum tweeted a subtle hint. We welcome and encourage visitors to use technology to engage with our exhibitions and programs while being respectful of our role as a memorial. The Arlington Cemetery, however, was a little more direct. We do not consider playing Pokemon Go to be appropriate decorum on the grounds of ANC. We ask all visitors to refrain from such activity. So what have we learned, Pokemon Go players? Stay out of corpse-infested rivers, don't follow lures down dark alleyways, stay off my lawn, and stay off my Nana's grave! Cause she died defending America! And that's why she's buried at Arlington. Niantic and the Pokemon Company released a joint statement to The Verge which encourages users to report inappropriate locations or content on the Pokemon Go support website. So that old Nana boy can rest in peace. Alright, moving on to the rest of the news and Pete, I'm taking this crap off. Trap! Trap! Leaving the cap though, because it feels jaunty. The MPD group just woke up from a 10 year coma and discovered people actually enjoy buying things on the internet. John, quick, zoom in! What? The market research company will start tracking digital sales by the end of the month. The digital games tracking service will pull down sales data from Xbox Live, the PlayStation Network and Steam, but only on games with participating publishers. EA, Activision, Ubisoft and a slew of other big names are on board, but noticeably absent at this point are Microsoft, Sony, Nintendo and Bethesda Softworks. MPD spokesperson David Riley told GamesIndustry.biz that they are launching this service after years of beta testing and have to launch now because if we waited to have every publisher in the world to sign up, it would take forever. And there are updates and content drops aplenty today too. Grand Theft Auto Online's Cunning Stunts expansion has gone live. It turns Los Santos into a big arcadey racetrack. And if you listen closely, you can hear John peeing himself with excitement. Pete, quick zoom out. See that trickle? Ah, I nearly caught it. Blizzard has announced a new World of Warcraft punishment system for abusive chat activity, which will launch alongside Legion later this year. They'll be giving people the silent treatment. Anyone found guilty of chat abuse will be given a 24 hour ban on all in-game communication. A second offense will double the downtime and the bans will keep doubling until one day all repeat offenders lose their voices for good. Or at least until they discover your TeamSpeak details and come harass you there. In Hearthstone, there's a charming new hero skin for the Shaman. Hear now his words of wisdom. <laughs> and finally, Overwatch has received its first new character since launch. Anna was announced yesterday evening and is already playable on PC on the PTR servers. She is a support class sniper who can heal allies from range and fire a sleep dart to knock out opponents. She's also Farrah's mum. Or I'd sound thing with that. There has been an awakening. Have you felt it? Ba, 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 da, ba, da, ba. Thing of the day. There's a sadistic joy in seeing people walk into things while distracted by technology. Pokemon Go is a sadist's greatest gift. Wow. That was funny. <laughs> Pokemon Go. <laughs> Holy shit. I did not realize that was water.
I know you got me, dude. I'm joined now by Goose to discuss his discussion of a topic on Good Game Yesterday, your IMO. Welcome. Hi. How are you? I'm good. Good. Welcome back to Australia. Thank you. Uh, you had an IMO yesterday on the episode which was about padding. Correct. Tell the people. Well, basically that I think padding is wonderful when it's not in the game. That I see what you did there. Yeah. You didn't pad out your answer. No. Well done. Well, Kept it short. Uh, and, and what spurred this? Well, basically, I think a lot of us played Inside, a game we reviewed last night as well. Uh, and coming off the back of that, it was a, you know, razor sharp, laser focused three hour experience. I know you really enjoyed it. Loved it. I loved it as well. Um, and coming out of that game, I just thought, wow, I would play three three hour amazing games rather than one nine hour game which is, you know, your $80 AAA campaign length, minimum length these days. And it got me thinking about the fact that I think so many games can be better when they trim the fat, take out the padding, and just enjoy those core experiences. I completely agree with you, but guess who doesn't? Ah, yes. The people. You guys. The people had opinions. The first one comes in from Blessings of Babylon, who says, the problem with the games you mentioned, uh, Firewatch, Journey, and so on, these were games you mentioned that did not have padding. Mm -hmm. uh, is that after you play it for an hour or two, that's it. Never a reason to look at it again. And while those are fine games, I then go and spend 50 plus hours in Assassin's Creed, 100 plus hours in Hearts of Iron, and 1000 plus hours in Civilization V. Willingly, padded out, you say, has content, I say. I mean, from the top, from <laughs> Blessings of Babylon all the way down, that was a well-written response. Blessings of Babylon. Uh, yeah. Yeah, look, I, I think coming off that, it's saying that there's a game you can return to, and there is more playability in that. I would argue that a game like Journey has stuck with me. Mm. I won't go back to play Journey again, but that experience will stay with me for a long time. Versus a game like, say, Assassin's Creed, which has a lot of content, which I call padding, uh, and in this case, doing a lot of repeated tasks like fetching feathers and yeah. just doing little side quests. Some who find it enjoyable, mm -hmm. like Blessings of Babylon, call that content. I see it for what it really is, which is just padding, which is just a repeated task to extend the length of the game. I love your enlightened look at games where it's like, Blessings of Babylon, blinded by the marketing. Mm, Goose. Yeah. Seer of all. They did mention Hearts of Iron and uh, Civilization V, which are, which are games where they're basically strategy games and you play them multiple times uh, and each time it's a different experience. But those games don't really contain padding. I mean, something like Civ isn't... Uh, I don't think you would classify that as a padding game. No, right? I used because that last night as a, yeah. a game that's been crafted well, that that experience just balloons out, but in the way that the, you know, the... The experience for the player gets wider and broader and more interesting. Yeah, and play. actually deeper the more you play it, the game becomes yeah. deeper. As opposed to Assassin's Creed where you go, you're doing a lot of things where it's just a slight variation on the last quest you did. You're doing that again, but in a different location. I think this lends itself more towards, uh, you know, linear games. Games that are trying to tell a story. And it's how long they choose to stretch that story out is where I'm really finding the issue. The man cannot be stopped. Now, moving on from someone who didn't agree with you to someone who strongly, totally disagrees with you. T. Peter 267 whose name I have mispronounced before. I totally disagree with Goose on this one. With a big game like Skyrim, it's about the world, not the story. And a stream of fetch quests directed me to new dungeons and to discover new random events. More importantly, it led me to spend so long just absorbing the world, longer than would ever be feasible to thoughtfully script. Indeed, I began to avoid quick traveling just because the trip was enjoyable. So the argument here, that these things are merely just an artifice to get you to go to new places to find your own story in this game. Yeah, a game like Skyrim is a tricky one because it's beloved by all. I loved it as well. Mm. And uh, I could say that, how many hours do you think that took you to finish complete? Uh, I've never finished it. Well, there uh, you go. So, but I, I put, uh, I think I put 90 hours into the game and... Yeah, I think I put roughly sort of 60 to 70 hours in there mm. as well. And I had a great time with that game. Um, but looking back, from those 60 hours, I could probably pull out at least 20 to 30 of quests that I didn't need, yeah. that were just there to, you know, fill the experience. There's a great quote by Jonathan Blow, which I can't quite remember, but the paraphrasing of it is that what's the point of having a big open world if you don't fill it with anything? And so his design philosophy behind, say, The Witness was you're on this island which you can cross in five minutes, mm. but it's so densely packed with stuff that everywhere you go there is something there rather than trying to stretch it out. I don't entirely agree with that. Really? Totally. 
I find that... But you just had the whole padding thing! Oh, no, 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 I'm saying you can have a large open world. Mm. I just don't think you need to cram it full of stuff. I've had really wonderful experiences just being in large, open, what some would argue is empty spaces. Mm -hmm. Games like Shadow of the Colossus, where it's there's nothing there, but I'm feeling alone and I'm feeling the weight of the story around me, even though there's nothing there telling me that story. I think games can be really powerful when they choose to hold things back. So, yeah, I just wanted to be left alone in Skyrim. You don't want an NPC just running up and annoying you while you're yeah, in the pushing moment. me in certain directions or getting in the way. I found all those mechanics were just obstructing what was my ability to go out and live freely in Skyrim. Here, let me rewrite Skyrim for you in the way that my understanding from everyone here at the Good Game Team, this is their Skyrim experience. Uh, game starts, get your first dragon shout, Lydia dies, 20 <laughs> hours of mourning, directed by Todd Howard. That is Skyrim. <laughs> that's, that's a paired back Skyrim. You'll keep this quiet, right? Yeah. I didn't care for Lydia. No? No. Oh my god, you are yeah. such a contrarian. Just don't mention that to anyone. Our final disagreement comes oh. in from Dan Dan the Suit Man, who was featured on this show this week. Hi, Dan. You got a suit? The general, I generally agree, but sometimes the boring and meaningless can be a good game in itself. Take, for instance, Harvest Moon or Papers, Please or Stardew Valley. Even things like The Sims. They are totally mindless and, aside from papers, don't have any real goal or meaning behind them. But it's sometimes satisfying to know that you're really good at something. <laughs> Some people, myself included, do like the lockpicking in games like Skyrim because after all the hundreds of hours you know you're going to spend on the game, you'll be able to return and see a lock that says Master Difficulty and just smirk because you know you have this. Also, watching numbers can get higher can be happily addictive. I don't know, I just think padding can entirely make or break a game, personal opinion. So his argument here is that he's getting better in Skyrim, and that sometimes the repetitiveness is why you go to a game. Do you think that's really a, a form of enjoyment that you actually feel good about, though? I love that this, this is not my opinion. <laughs> this is, Goose, your opinion is wrong. <laughs> Well, no, what I would say to that, and, and I'm a bit worried because he came out firing with the game like Harvest Moon at the start, which mm. I played a lot of that game. And Stardew Valley, which I played a fair bit of that. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that's a kind of game where you are doing these sort of monotonous tasks, or you are doing just sort of fundamental farming, mm. which is not uh, an extraordinary task to be doing in a game, and you'll do a lot of it over a long amount of time. It's a big middle finger to all you farmers out there, by the way. It's a very important thing that we need to have be, be doing. Don't take me wrong there. Uh, no, but what I would say to that is that I came out of hours and hours and hours of playing Harvest Moon and having little bits of fun the whole way through. Mm. And it was almost like the hangover of video games. <laughs> I basically finished it and went, what did I do? Why did I spend so much time doing that? Yeah. And that feeling hung over that game kind of, yeah, always tainting what was an okay experience the whole way through. <laughs> Whereas... <laughs> always tainting an okay experience. My okay experience was always ruined. But again, to bring it back to something I mentioned last night, like, say, Firewatch or one of those mm. short condensed games, I came out of that, like, hungry for more. And I could say nothing but good things about that game because that's how I was left after it. So I guess I'm talking about how you feel when you step away from a game. Can I, I mean, you know how I always call you an elitist? Sure. Can I explain why I think you and I are both elitists right now? Okay. Besides the pinky. <laughs> uh, it's that we are in a very privileged position to be able to play a lot of games. Sure. And that as I have played more and more games throughout my life, and even before I started here, I would play almost everything I could get my hands on. It get, you get to this point where you go, oh, there's a finite amount of time and everything starts blending together. And so I can't, I can't differentiate between Assassin's Creed games, but I can go inside is something that is completely different to something else. Undertale was a game that I haven't seen before or probably again. Exactly, and I mean, for you, you would prefer to never see it again. And so that we are valuing these experiences because they are different from so many other things that we play all the time. Whereas if you're someone who only has, you know, a small amount of money... Or just handpicks a couple of games. Yeah, and that you yeah. go like, you know, I'm in school and I don't have that much cash and my parents buy me something. You want a game that lasts you 100 hours, even if it is just picking locks mm. um, or wandering around collecting feathers because you go, this, this is... This is still fun. This is my game. This is how I game. I, I would say to that though that I think there are enough. The, of those... the, the screw you, kid. Go <laughs> get a job. Buy some games. I would say that there are enough shorter or you know medium length games that play their mechanics so much better. Mm that I think you could fill up the time that you would do your 100 hours of a AAA game with a handful of smaller games that mm -hmm. you would have more varied experiences, you would have better, well-defined experiences in games than filling up your time with, you know, 100 hours of Skyrim. All right, so what we've established here is Goose has no idea how time and 
money work that you cannot buy. They are. They... You can't buy a hundred hours worth of insight with the same money you would have spent on Skyrim. Those games are not often AAA, so they're often a little cheaper. And so if you were to buy, you know, Undertale and a few of those games, they're cheaper games. Mm -hmm. And I would say that you stack them all together. And you've got six of those games, and you got Skyrim. I'll take these six, please. Still doesn't work like that, but but I, I, I like the world you live in. Can you help me with my taxes? All right, let us know in the comments uh, what you think about this whole padding situation. Is he just being an elitist? I mean, we, a we, because I do agree with you, but I'd let you just hang yourself by your own rope. Uh, and while you're on the internet, please suggest a talk through topic for tomorrow. While you're on the internet, check out Good Game on Facebook, YouTube, and if you want to meet fellow Pocketeers, then join the Pocketeers Facebook group and Steam group. You can follow Good Game on Twitter at Good Game TV, follow Pocket at Nick Boy, at Pierre, at GG Edit Monkey, at Sam Gee. He's at Goose Bangus, and there are links to everything I just said in the description below. Put the pinky away. Sorry. We are of the people. Today's thing of the day was made by Jacob Bradbeer. If you've made a thing like Jacob, please send it in. Till tomorrow, Nick Boy out. Mwah. Goose out. Like, here's the thing, right? Inside took three hours to finish. Yep. And that game's 15 to 20 bucks. So you can buy, you can buy four to five of those with the price that you would get full retail price Skyrim. Yeah. So then that that only four equates to like fifteen is... hours. And Skyrim, you're getting one to two hundred hours. Carry what?